Mr. Kenny. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to colleagues, for this opportunity to speak uh, to third reading on the Carbon Tax Repeal Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, our party has been working since the day of its creation for this moment, this opportunity <clears throat> to uh, remove this huge deadweight cost on, that punishes hardworking people for living ordinary lives in this province. But, Mr. Speaker, let me begin by tracing the history of this damaging tax uh, imposed by the previous NDP government. First of all, Mr. Speaker, uh, we can cast our minds back to the 2015 general election, uh, in, in which the NDP published its platform that did not utter a single word or even hint at a carbon tax or whatever euphemism uh, they choose to use, a carbon price, a carbon levy, a, uh, uh, th there was no allusion to it at all, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, in a, the annex of the NDP platform, they delineated uh, 12 tax policy changes, not a single one referring to the carbon tax. Uh, this was, without, without imputing uh, any motive to members of the Assembly, of course, Mr. Speaker, but this was a huge act of political deception it, it fo foisted on Alberta voters. A government that, a party that knew perfectly well its intention to impose a carbon tax, but hid that intention from voters, here, here. Mr. Speaker. And yet, within days of um, becoming government, they, within weeks, they appointed a commission uh, which ultimately gave the NDP government the recommendation it was looking for to impose a carbon tax on Albertans without democratic consent, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it is no wonder that since that day, four years ago, uh, over two-thirds of Albertans in every single public opinion poll taken on, taken on the issue have demonstrated consistent opposition to the tax on living law, uh, their normal lives imposed by the NDP by the carbon tax. So, Mr. Speaker, at least what we are doing today is restoring a sense of respect for democracy in this province. Because unlike the NDP, which foisted a uh, car carbon tax on Albertans without uh, having been transparent with them in the last election, this was one of our central commitments, Mr. Speaker. That is why it is Bill Number 1. And so uh, this is a renewal, not only uh, an F part of our job creation strategy to renew Alberta's economy, but this is also, in part, a renewal of the spirit of democracy in Alberta politics here, here today. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, uh, let me point out that the NDP callously imposed this tax on people for the crime of heating their homes and filling up their gas tanks to go to work in the midst of the worst economic downturn in this province since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, how callous do you have to be, Mr. Speaker, when people are losing their jobs, their businesses, their homes, when their incomes are declining, uh, when uh, in desperation many people were left the province? How callous! Do you have to be to make that bad situation of economic adversity even worse? You know, one of the things I, I find, frankly, so distasteful, Mr. Speaker, is the, uh, the constant tendency of the NDP and their ideological fellow travellers to refer to themselves as, quotes, progressives. Mr. Speaker, what is progressive about telling a widow on a fixed income that she has to pay more to heat her home. What is compassionate about the leader of the opposition, the then Premier, saying, if you don't like it, then perhaps you should take the bus or walk to work? Here, here. What understanding is there in that comment of the challenges that ordinary people face? The NDP, in its callousness, not understanding that for the vast majority of Albertans, walking to work is not an option. Yep. That there is, in many cases, if not most, really no bus to take. What about the working people that the NDP uh, ridiculously claims historically to represent? The working people who need to take their pickup to work with their, with their tools and their equipment. Mm 
Mr. Speaker, they don't, there's no bus that they can take. Exactly. There's no change of, of, of life they can make in, in this real world to avoid paying a carbon tax. So all it does is to punish those people for doing what they ought to do, which is to work hard and take care of their families. Punishing moms and dads for driving their kids to hockey practice, punishing seniors for heating their homes. What this government said it was it would become more expensive to do what you've got to do simply to survive in this cold northern economy. Callous and regressive, not progressive, Mr. Speaker. You know, um, let me then speak to the, the, the basic uh, purported uh, concept of, of so-called carbon pricing. Now, theoretically, uh, for example, uh, I'm sure that Professor Leach at the University of Alberta, who in part designed uh, this carbon tax, which will be repealed uh, today or very shortly, Professor Leach and others would say that, and I'll try to be um, objective and, and fair in, in representing their general view, they would say that uh, a carbon tax is more efficient than regulation uh, and that carbon taxes can be an efficient form of environmental policy to reduce CO2 emissions if, if they are revenue neutral, that is to say, if they displace other taxes, other taxes are reduced uh, proportionate to the carbon tax increase. Secondly, if they displace uh, other regulations, so it's a substitute for regulations in the theoretical, theoretical carbon tax model. Thirdly, if they are progressive with very generous um, uh, 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 rebates. And fourthly, if they are of general application, uh, it, uh, it globally, or at least amongst competing economies. So uh, let me walk through each four of those uh, uh, principles, because, Mr. Speaker, none of them apply to the NDP carbon tax. So I say to those who, who are theoretical supporters of some conceptual, perfect, utopian carbon tax, that that is not what we are debating in this House today. That is not what the NDP imposed on us four years ago. Uh, to the contrary, Mr. Speaker, it was 100% um, new revenue. It was, frankly, Mr. Speaker, yep. nothing but a tax grab, here, here. A, a, a political tax grab. There was not one cent in offsetting tax reductions. To the contrary, Mr. Speaker, the NDP, in the midst of, the histor of an historic recession, while tens of thousands of people were losing their jobs, what did the NDP do? They raised taxes on everything, not just on heating homes and filling up gas tanks, but also on job creators and on incomes and on the property, on the provincial portion of property taxes. And they conspired with their ally, Mr. Trudeau, to raise payroll taxes uh, on Albertans making it even more expensive here, here. for job creators to hire people. So the theory is you're supposed to uh, reduce taxes to offset the revenue gain from a carbon tax. This socialist crowd did exactly the opposite, Mr. Speaker. They raised taxes while imposing the carbon tax. Cumulatively, all of this increasing the, the tax burden on the productive sector of our economy in a way that deepened and prolonged the longest recession since, uh, since the Great Depression, Mr. Wow. Speaker. And so uh, on, on, on principle number one of the carbon tax, this was a complete failure. Mm -hmm. Principle number two, replacing, re offsetting uh, regula regulations. Well, Mr. Speaker, did the government reduce a single regulation to uh, effectively replace, quotes, costly regs with, uh, with a carbon tax? No. In, to the contrary, Mr. Speaker, they, they increased regs week after week, month after month, specifically regs ostensibly to deal with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and they, they supported uh, similar new regulatory burdens imposed, imposed by their allies in the federal Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, uh, 
All, all they did was to add to the regulatory dead weight uh, burden on the Alberta economy with a tax that is notionally supposed to replace uh, the regulatory burden. So on principle number two of an ideal carbon tax, that what we are debating today, the NDP's tax, was a complete failure. Thirdly, they're supposed to, these taxes are supposed to be uh, notionally progressive. And uh, the NDP will talk ad nauseum about uh, uh, rebates. But, Mr. Speaker, only uh, about only 40% of the revenues generated from the carbon tax went back in rebates, and those rebates only went to a select number of individuals in about 60% of Alberta households. Now, by contrast, while, I, while we oppose uh, the, the federal carbon tax, by contrast, 90% of the revenues generated by the federal carbon tax go back in rebates to 100% of households, and, that, and based on today's announcement, to small businesses as well. There was no rebate, by the way, Mr. Speaker, for um, the small businesses impacted by the NDP carbon tax, who will, as a result of this bill, save an estimated $4,500 per year on average. There was no rebate uh, for the nonprofits and charities who, were who had to struggle to pay the, the carbon tax bill. No uh, rebates for the school boards that had to uh, pay more simply to run their school buses. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you a couple of concrete examples of, the, uh, of that kind of regressivity. Um, I, I visited the uh, West Country Senior Centre in my uh, friend, the Honourable the Government House Leader's constituency of uh, Rimby, or sorry, Rimby, Rimby, Rocky, Mountain Rimby, Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry. And uh, it's a wonderful spot, Mr. Speaker. I recommend that, that members go and visit it to see really the volunteer spirit in Alberta generally, particularly rural Alberta. This is a wonderful little spot where run 100% by volunteer labour, uh, where the community, community gathers to, provide, to keep seniors active. And they go and they, they, they play cards and shuffleboard and they have exercise activities. And uh, I think I was, I, we were there for a darts tournament. And uh, it, it's just a wonderful spot. Now, the West Country Senior Centre, Mr. Speaker, I met with the executive uh, board. They uh, operate that place, get this, on a budget of $18,000 for the entire year. For the entire year. Now, they bring in a few thousand dollars in offsetting revenues from uh, uh, hall rentals, but, you know, otherwise they're paying for it with a $20 membership fee and the odd little donation here and there. NDP comes along, slaps on the carbon tax that they hid from voters in the last election, mm -hmm. and suddenly the uh, heating costs went up, and then they went up again. And they were having to pay, I think it was uh, upwards of $2,000 in carbon tax to heat the Sundry's senior centre. And, and they, they, they called the Premier's office to say, is there any help for us to, to cover the burden of what you've imposed? Because we, we may have to close the place down. I mean, my, my honourable colleague can verify that they, were at, they looked at, at, at possibly having to close the senior centre down. That's correct. They called the Premier's office, uh, the now Leader of the Opposition, and the staff there said, we suggest you raise your membership fees. Have a fun yeah. ha seniors, Mr. Speaker, mm -hmm. on fixed incomes being told that they had to pay more so the NDP could scoop more revenue from them? Wow. That's, is that progressive? No. Is that compassionate? What about the Calgary, uh, Public, uh, uh, Calgary Board of Education? Uh, the Honourable Member, my colleague from, uh, Chest, from Strathmore, Airdrie, could correct me, but I believe they were paying uh, over a million dollars a year to pay carbon tax to, to drive, to operate their fleet of, of school buses. Wow. And they had to cut uh, routes uh, uh, and reduce access to, to school busing for, for students. And, and if I'm not mistaken, a lot of that happened. In, in uh, my colleague, the Minister of uh, Community and Social Services constituency, and many parents are upset to this day mm -hmm. as a result of the loss of bus service. And many of those are new Canadian families, mm -hmm. and, and some of them are low-income new Canadian families whose kids now struggle to get to alternative schools, in part because of this car. How is that progressive, Mr. Speaker? 
to tell low-income new Canadian families, sorry, you can't get your kid to an alternative program so they can get a great start in life because we need to scoop that revenue to, uh, and because we believe in punishing people for, for what is nothing more than empty virtue signaling, Mr. Speaker. And I'll get to that in a moment. So on the uh, question of progress, oh, and by the way, here's the, here's the whopper on progressivity. The NDP claimed there would be these generous rebates, Mr. Speaker. But then in, in um, last year's budget, uh, the then finance minister revealed, not transparently in the documents, but only under questioning from the media, he, he was forced to tell the truth and to admit that as the carbon tax went up and up and up, that there would be no increase in the so-called low-income rebates. Wow. So let, let, let me just paint the picture here, Mr. Speaker. They started their carbon tax at 20 bucks a ton. And then they raised it by 50% the next year to $30 a ton. And then their plan, and this was their, their entire fiscal plan was predicated on this, mm -hmm. was to raise that to the next increment was to go to 40 and then $50 a ton. Of course, they weren't going to stop there because as the then environment minister and the premier both admitted, uh, they would continue to, uh, quotes, increase the stringency of the, uh, car of the uh, climate leadership levy um, in coordination with the federal government. Now, Mr. Speaker, one rule of thumb I have uh, in, in politics is if you have to use an entire string of euphemisms to disguise what you're actually doing, it's probably because it's not good for, for Albertans. <laughs> Hey, increase the stringency on the climate leadership levy. Let me translate yeah. that into plain English, Mr. Speaker. That meant increasing the tax on Albertans. Yes. Wow. And that was their plan to go from 30, from the 20 to 30, they got us there, and then to go to 50, and then to go higher and higher and higher. In fact, they wanted to tie themselves to their allies, the Trudeau Liberals, whose environment ministry has admitted through a... a uh, documents obtained through access to information that they intend ultimately to raise the carbon tax to uh, $300 a ton. Wow. And that really shouldn't be a surprise, Mr. Speaker, because um, the, all, all of the hardcore carbon tax advocates admit that for it to have a sufficient impact on people's behavior, let me translate that, for it to force people to turn the heat down enough in the winter and to give up driving to work, for it to force people to do that sufficiently to, to significantly reduce CO2 emissions requires a price, and I'm now paraphrasing Professor Leach, the principal author of this tax, requires a price of at least $200 a ton. Wow. So that's where they're headed. And in fact, uh, the... the our colleagues opposite frequently cite um, uh, the UN International Panel on Climate Change, which reduced a which excuse me published a paper uh, last year, Mr. Speaker, which said that uh, which called for a carbon tax of between um, five hundred dollars a ton and five thousand dollars a ton. $5,000 a ton. So that is where, so this is all, as I've always said, this is all about the frog in the pot, Mr. Speaker. It's always been about an incremental tax grab. They benignly start at $20, and uh, most people probably wasn't a huge irritant, and then they raise it to 30, then it was going to go to 50, and then the federal government says to 90, and then eventually to 300, and then, according to the UN experts, it should go up to $5,000. So making it effectively impossible to live normal lives in this northern cold climate. That is where they were headed. So, Mr. Speaker, here's the point. As the price was to go up from 30 to 50, and, 50 and beyond 50, no increase in the rebates. So let's, the, progressivity, what does this mean? This means that the poorest Albertans, the people living on Aish with no uh, earned income, for example, uh, people living on social assistance, uh, seniors living on GIS, would have zero 
relief from the government as they had to pay more for the crime of heating their homes. Wow. And, and nothing for the embedded increase in the cost of buying groceries. Because you know what the carbon tax does, Mr. Speaker? It makes the cost of transporting things more expensive. Means everything goes up. And when you go to the grocery store, everything has been transported, a lot of it from great distances. So the price of everything goes up as a result, Mr. Speaker. And, and so let's be clear, the, the, these, the, the NDP who call themselves progressives, in voting against this, if they vote against this bill, Mr. Speaker, what they are telling low-income Albertans is that they want to return to the NDP plan of taking money out of the scarce budgets of people on the very lowest levels of income. And I think that is shameful, one of the reasons we need to pass the, the uh, Carbon Tax Repeal Act. Yeah. So on the fourth principle then, Mr. Speaker, of, of conceptual idea of a carbon tax, it has to, to be effective, it must be of general application. What does that mean? Well, what it means, Mr. Speaker, is that the uh, challenge of, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which I acknowledge is important, is a global challenge. It is not a challenge that is limited to the borders of Alberta. In fact, we could shut down Alberta's economy uh, tomorrow, heaven knows the NDP certainly tried, and that would reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by about uh, two-tenths of a percent, by 0.2 percent. So 99.8 percent of global emissions would continue, and in most countries continue to rise. In fact, the incre incremental growth in CO2 emissions from the People's Republic of China alone next year would completely consume the, the uh, elimination of the Alberta economy uh, in terms of uh, its impact on global emissions. So why do, I, why do I paint this kind of absurd example to, in order for us to understand that it, it doesn't matter how much pain we impose on Albertans. If the rest of the world is not doing its part, it will not matter one whit. Now, Mr. Speaker, we have seen um, the flight of tens of billions of dollars of investment capital from Alberta, which is one of the reasons we've seen the loss of tens of thousands of jobs. Much of that capital has moved from Alberta's energy sector to the energy sector in other jurisdictions. So, and, and, and very often to other jurisdictions with lower environmental standards, and in every instance, that capital has moved from Alberta with the carbon tax to energy producers without a carbon tax. In fact, of the world's 10 largest oil and gas producers, Alberta is the only one to have imposed a carbon tax on itself. Um, the United States, uh, which has doubled oil production in the past decade, much of it, I will add, under uh, former President Obama's tenure, the same president who talk, talked a lot about greenhouse gas emissions and blocked the Keystone XL pipeline, that president oversaw a doubling of oil production, no carbon tax. Uh, Russia, the world's largest current contemporary producer of oil, with radically lower environmental standards than Canada, no carbon tax. Venezuela, with the largest recoverable reserves on Earth, run by a brutal socialist dictatorship, uh, no carbon tax. I guess they didn't get the memo from Socialist International that they're supposed to <laughs> impose a carbon tax. Um, Saudi, Ara uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I think the th fourth largest reserves, uh, sorry, the second largest reserves on earth, no carbon tax. Uh, Qatar, the Islamic Republic of Iran, et al., no carbon taxes. Now, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the industrialized world is going in the opposite direction for reasons I will explain uh, in a few moments. Um, the industrialized world is moving away, not towards, but away from carbon taxes. Well, let's look at Canada, for example. Uh, in Ontario, they had a facsimile of a carbon tax called the uh, cap-and-trade system, which was repudiated by Ontario voters in their election last year and has been repealed as a result. Uh, in, in New Brunswick, they elected a government that, on, on uh, the commitment to oppose the carbon tax. Uh, in uh, Saskatchewan, the government was re-elected on the commitment to oppose a carbon tax. 
Uh, in Manitoba, the provincial government there had intended to cooperate with the federal government until they learned that it was, it was uh, Ottawa's way or the highway, that there was going to be no compromise, that Ottawa insisted on a 30 and then 50 and then $90 carbon tax, so Premier Pallister pulled out no carbon tax. Uh, let's look down south, Washington State, which is uh, ar arguably the most liberal, or certainly one of the most liberal or, uh, states in the United States, has voted now not once, but twice in the past three years in referenda to oppose the imposition of carbon taxes. Um, our friends in Australia, which in many ways perhaps the most similar uh, liberal democracy to Canada, the um, former sister party of the ND, sorry, the sister party of the NDP there, the Labour Party of Australia, they are both members of uh, Socialist International, uh, the Labour government seven years ago imposed a carbon tax. But then voters said, this is ridiculous, this is hurting our, uh, our livelihoods, our economy, and it's doing nothing for the environment. So voters elected a, a small c conservative, large L liberal government that immediately repealed the Aussie carbon tax. Now, here's, some, here's a very interesting uh, footnote. Uh, that Australian Conservative government was re-elected last week on its pledge to continue opposing job-killing policies of the Labour Party. In the same election, the Labour Party, the sister party of the NDP in Australia, said it would never again impose a carbon tax on Australia. So even the sister parties and Socialist International are fleeing from the idea of carbon taxes because they know that it's all economic pain and no environmental gain, Mr. Speaker. The only folks not to get the memo are in this House. Uh, they're the only ones, Mr. Speaker. In, in France, they had intended to impose a carbon tax under a socialist government, another sister party in Socialist International. And guess what? The socialist government of, of uh, former President Francois Hollande said at the last minute, no, we're not going to proceed with this. And you know what the, the massive protests in the streets of, of, of France in the past uh, several months, uh, threatening the stability of their government, you know what the central issue motivating those protest, protests is? It's uh, ridiculously high taxes on energy that, are all, that already exist in France that are, that are creating energy poverty for middle class people. These are protests led, by and large, by middle-class suburban people in France who are saying, we can't afford to run our small businesses, to drive to work anymore. And so, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is clear that there is the, the industrialized world is moving in the opposite direction. So here's the point. If at least peer juris jurisdictions with whom we compete economically are not imp imposing a tax like this on themselves, then what's the point? All we end up doing is creating what economists call carbon leakage, mm -hmm. which really means capital leakage or jobs leakage. It means that uh, if we make it more expensive to produce and consume energy and our competing jurisdictions don't, then that, ener that energy production, that energy consumption will, according to the basic laws of economics, simply move to other jurisdictions. And that's exactly what has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Just simply take a flight down to Houston and go to the West Permian, and you will see the biggest boom in energy production in American history, in, in North American history, or drive across the uh, Saskatchewan border to North Dakota and see what's happening in the Bakken Reserve. And you will see this huge explosion and, and, and when you look out and you see those drilling rigs and those service rigs, Mr. Speaker, if you look closely, you'll see a lot of them are from Canada. A lot of them are from Alberta. This has been a massive shift of labor, of money, of equipment, and of jobs. If you don't believe me, Mr. Speaker, just take a drive 20 minutes south of here. Go to Ritchie Brothers in Leduc the constituency of my friend from, uh, from Beaumont, uh, Leduc. And you will see, at any given time, thousands of pieces of equipment being auctioned off. They have had to auction off 
billions of dollars worth of equipment in the past yes. four years, M much of it, if not most of it, being purchased by American companies at fire sale prices. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Very often, that equipment initially belonged, before it went into receivership or bankruptcy, that equipment went belonged to small Alberta enterprises, uh, gals and guys who, who rolled their life savings into starting that small oil field service company, that small drilling company. Um, I see my, my, uh, the, the member for, for Drayton Valley. His community has been devastated with companies exactly like that, one after another after another being bankrupt. I remember I visited one in, in, in July of, of 2016. They had gone from um, 400 employees to 200 employees. I went back to visit them in July of 2018. company didn't exist anymore. That's the story of Drayton Valley. That's the story of much of Alberta in the last four years. So here's the point. All of that equipment that moves south, that's sitting at the Ritchie Brothers yard, it's moving to produce energy in jurisdictions that do not have a carbon tax. So what is the point? You know, Mr. Speaker, the only, re if we really compel the NDP to be honest about this, and oh, finally, oh, I guess I'll, I'll add a, a fifth obvious principle of a carbon tax. It's supposed to reduce emissions. It's supposed to reduce emissions. Well, Mr. Speaker, how's that working out? <coughs> it, fascinating. Last December, CBC was doing a year-end interview with the then Premier, and they asked her, um, by how much are you reducing emissions with the carbon tax? And she said, I I'm sorry, I'll have to get back to you. I wasn't briefed on that. I wasn't briefed on that? I wasn't briefed on that. On the centerpiece policy of the entire NDP government didn't have an answer. And I'll tell you why she didn't have an answer. Because the answer is there is zero measurable reduction in Alberta greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the NDP's uh, retail carbon tax. In fact, um, a uh, professor, somebody could look this up for me, professor at uh, Simon Fraser University, an economist who's a strong, uh, Mark Jacquard is his name. Mark Jacquard wrote an op, Professor Jacquard wrote, wrote an op-ed uh, in the Globe and Mail last December. He is a strong advocate of uh, carbon taxes, the, I think particularly the, the pure and ideal form that I'm trying to describe. And Professor Jacquard essentially said in this op-ed that um, the, he said that at most, at most, the NDP carbon tax in Alberta would be responsible for 5% of the total emissions reductions projected to happen in this province as a result of shutting down all the other measures, like primarily shutting down coal plants. So even their academic fans on carbon taxes have admitted that at most the carbon tax had a negligible effect, a basically immeasurable effect on greenhouse gas emissions. And yet these guys prance around claiming that this is going to save the global environment. It's going to save the world, Mr. Speaker. Making widows pay more to heat their homes while the rest of the developed world is turning away from carbon pricing and uh, the, the developing world is massively increasing emissions. Exactly. It, it is a total charade, exactly. ma madam, Mr. Speaker. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me then turn my attention to the uh, impact that this uh, has had uh, on the Alberta. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, um, the NDP ended up, yeah, this is, uh, thank you, I the quote from this, Professor Jacquard, December 14th, 2018, Globe and Mail, quote, headline, divisive carbon prices are much ado about nothing. Because he goes on to say that uh, the impact here, I'll quote, uh, Pollsters say that the Alberta Premier's carbon tax contributes significantly to her dim re-election prospects. Well, that turns out to have been prophetic. I, I, ironically, my, my research team finds the new tax in Alberta will cause only as much as 5% of her climate plan's projected reductions. The heavy lifting is from coal plant phase-out, methane regulations, 
pre-existing flex reg on large industries and a cap in oil sands emissions. I'll bet she wishes an economist had told her she didn't need the tax and that it does almost nothing anyway. Yep. Quote, unquote. Now, just to be clear, this is not some supporter of, of my party. This is a fellow who is a carbon tax advocate, Mr. Speaker, who says, can I let me see that again? He says that the NDP carbon tax, which we are repealing today, quotes, does almost nothing, Mr. Speaker. So, it is the NDP tax increasingly regressive, not progressive, uh, not revenue neutral, but instead a tax grab, um, not of general application because the rest of the world is not doing it, in fact, going in the opposite direction, and not reducing emissions. Again, I ask, so what is the point? And I, the best I, answer I can come up with is this, Mr. Speaker. It makes them feel better about themselves. It makes them feel virtuous. And it, it, it makes, us, it makes the, the, the NDP feel like, like they are they're somehow saving the planet by forcing people, to, by punishing people for living normal lives. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry, but the charade ends in this place today. As we, as we speak... As we speak with clarity on behalf of the vast majority of Albertans who have said from day one that they oppose this punishing tax and today we will liberate Albertans from that tax with the adoption of this bill, our central election commitment. Mr. Speaker, promise made, promise kept. The carbon tax repeal. And with this bill, Mr. Speaker, a family that has two cars will save up to $1,800 over the next four years alone, and that's not accounting for how high they would have raised it. Mr. Speaker, scrapping the carbon tax will reduce the tax burden on Albertans by $1.4 billion. As best we can tell, this represents the single largest tax cut in Alberta fiscal history, yeah. right here, today. Um, and Mr. Speaker, 70% of Alberta's middle-income families will be saving up to $1,150 as a result of repealing the carbon tax. It is estimated by Stokes Economics, a highly regarded independent econometric firm, that the repeal of the carbon tax will result in the creation of at least 6,000 new full-time private sector jobs. And um, it will... Uh, and let me give you some detail on that. 1,400 new jobs in manufacturing, 1,200 new jobs in the trades, nearly 1,000 new jobs in transportation and warehousing. It, Stokes Economics in, uh, estimates that this repeal will increase our economy, our gross domestic product, by $1.3 billion, that it will save the average small business $4,500, that it will say, help charities some of whom estimate that they pay more than $35,000 per year in carbon taxes under the NDP. Charities like the Calgary Food Bank, who will be able to hire a new employee as a result of, saving, of the savings from this carbon tax. This will allow the Sundry Senior Centre to, to stay, keep their doors open. This will allow, ho hopefully, the Calgary Board of Education to bring back the bus services that it had to reduce. Mr. Speaker, I hope it will allow my condo strata board to increase the condo fees they told me they raised in order to pay for the carbon tax. Yeah. Maybe that's a conflict of interest. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, let, me, let me add that another uh, alleged rationale for the NDP carbon tax was that it was going to acquire for us something called uh, social license. Do you remember that one? Social license. We were going to get basically through the magic of punishing people for heating their homes, what it was going to do was going to turn David Suzuki and Elizabeth May and the BC New Democrats and everybody else from pipeline opponents to pipeline proponents. That somehow, by showing them just how virtuous the NDP in Alberta was, we were going to get social license and public support, political approval for the construction of pipelines to get 
a fair price for our energy products. Well, how did, the, how did that turn out, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> yeah. I, I've, ch I ch I've challenged the NDP in this House in the past, and I'll, I'll extend this challenge yet once more. Please identify for me a single political actor, political party, municipal government, provincial government, uh, environmental organization, uh, First Nation leader, uh, academic, a prom prominent a commentator, a media commentator, please identify a single one that moved from opposition to pipelines in general and the Trans Mountain Pipeline in particular to support for those pipelines as a result of the NDP carbon tax. I've been asking that question for three years and I haven't been able to get an answer from any of the carbon tax advocates and I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker, because not one single person, entity, government, party, or interest group move from no to yes on pipelines as a result of the NDP carbon tax. On that criteria alone, it was a complete and catastrophic failure. And Mr. Speaker, that's, you know what? I, I know the NDP, boy, they, they sure did this in the campaign. They love calling people all kinds of derogatory names. They love the politics of fear and smear. And so when we say, that we think the carbon tax is hurting our economy but not helping our environment. They stand up and they say they use phrases like deniers. Mm -hmm. You know historically where that phrase comes from. Exactly. Let's face it, Mr. Speaker. Design, rhetoric designed to impose, frankly, moral opprobrium on those uh, uh, targeted by it. Exactly. Outrageous mm -hmm. language. Sure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't. This government does not deny. Uh, climate science, that there is change in, in the global climate, there are uh, anthropogenic as, as well as natural causes that we need to reduce carbon emissions. It's a, it's a moral and environmental imperative. Absolutely. And that is why we will be bringing forward uh, this, this autumn our, our tier uh, fund, which will be a levy on major emitters, continuing the tradition where Alberta was the first jurisdiction in North America, one of the first in the developed world to address major industrial emissions through such a fund. And this fund will uh, produce revenues that will be directed to funding uh, research and uh, scientific developments to help reduce carbon output, reduce gr greenhouse gas emissions. Which technology and which innovations we can then share with the developing world where they have this, this, this huge challenge? But let me speak to that for a moment, Mr. Speaker. We Albertans, we Canadians sometimes become, I think, a bit complacent. We some have a tendency, perhaps, sometimes to take for granted uh, just how uh, high our standard of living is. But there are billions of people around the world, roughly half the world's population, that still does not have access to reliable energy. Hundreds of millions of people who have to cook their dinner with a, on a small propane stove or with, um, uh, with wood fire. My friend, the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs, grew up in such a village in Nigeria where people can't go and flick a switch and be sure that the power will be there uh, and knows what it means to live in energy poverty. My friend from uh, Edmonton Southwest understands the radical difference that abundant and affordable energy makes to realizing human potential and raising up the standards of living of people. One of the great uh, achievements of uh, post-war history has been the massive increase in global living standards and the huge reductions in absolute levels of poverty. And one of the primary reasons for that has been uh, access to affordable energy. But there are still too many people around the world who do not have that, which, which we take for granted. And so I understand why the governments of China and India and Nigeria and all through the developing world are seeking to offer affordable energy to their people to help move them, lift them out of poverty. And unfortunately, in many cases, that means energy production with high carbon intensity. Now, so it is not morally correct for those of us in uh, the northern countries, in the prosperous west, to tell the developing world that they cannot 
offer energy to their people. Here, here. To the contrary, it is incumbent upon us to help them find ways to produce that energy with a shrinking environmental and greenhouse gas emission uh, footprint. That's in the real world, Mr. Speaker, not in some abstract utopian world. In the real world, that is the challenge. Uh, my, my friend, the Associate Minister for, uh, drugs, uh, for Mental Health and Addiction, uh, was born and raised in China, where they have been bringing on stream every year dozens of additional coal-fired power plants. And, and they do it because of the massive growth in the population and the energy demands. They want to move away from coal production. And the single best way we could help them to do so as Canadians, the single most practical thing we could do to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions would be, Mr. Speaker, to get our clean Alberta natural gas to China through LNG exports. Here, here. And that's what we need to focus on, Mr. Speaker. Not punishing widows for heating their homes when it's 30 below in Edmonton, but getting our liquefied natural gas to China, to India. Let me tell you, uh, Mr. Speaker, the first time I met my friend, the recently re-elected Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, was in uh, 2008 in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, when he was the chief minister of that state. And uh, I, I'll never forget, uh, chief, then Chief Minister Modiji said to me, he said, Minister, what can we in India do, in Gujarat, what can we do to get access to your natural gas? He said, I'm spending billions on uh, a new uh, LNG uh, port facilities so we can offload LNG from around the world. And he said, because Modi, Prime Minister Modi is a huge opponent of terrorism and, and extremism. And he said to me, Minister, I don't want to have to buy natural gas from the countries that are funding terrorism that is killing my citizens. I want to buy natural gas from the country that we admire most, Canada. Help us get that natural gas so we, we can move from coal to, to a, a radically lower emissions profile with uh, liquefied natural gas. This was a plea to me from the now Prime Minister of India 11 years ago, Mr. Speaker. But we're not one inch closer to getting India or China that natural gas. These are the things on which we... So yes, we do agree on one thing with the NDP, that there is an urgency, there is an imperative to take concrete action to reduce CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. But again, Punishing people for driving their kids to soccer is not the way to do it, Mr. Speaker. Ultimately, ultimately, the solutions on this huge challenge will be found through constant technological innovation. And that is why the centerpiece of our government's uh, climate strategy, which will be released in the fall, is... Uh, the, the tier levy on major emitters. It will affect um, about 60% of the emissions from the Alberta economy and the emissions that come from heavy industry that, quite frankly, be much better position to pay than ordinary Albertans. And secondly, that revenue will go into fu funding pure and applied research that, that can help us to reduce emissions here and around the world. We estimate that that tier fund and that tier levy will reduce emissions by approximately 40 uh, to 45 uh, megatons. That's a significant contribution, Mr. Speaker, uh, to, to the um, national target, uh, to the Paris uh, uh, climate targets. It doesn't get us all the way there. And we acknowledge that other measures will have to be taken. Uh, but we can take practical measures that do not punish ordinary people. So, Mr. Speaker, let me then turn my attention to, um, uh, to the threat of the imposition of a federal carbon tax. Uh, because one of the specious claims of the NDP is that the passage of this bill will simply uh, invite the federal government to impose a tax on us. No, Mr. Speaker, we do not invite the federal government to impose a carbon tax on Alberta. Should they seek to do so, we will oppose it at every measure, immediately filing an application 
for a judicial reference on the constitutionality of that federal intrusion into our jurisdiction at the Alberta Court of Appeal. Here, here. And simultaneously, I have instructed uh, the Honourable the, uh, Minister of Justice to uh, assist the government of Saskatchewan by seeking intervener status in supporting their appeal of the recent Saskatchewan Appeal Court reference on the federal carbon, carbon tax to uh, the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm further proud to say that the, because the, gov the NDP government of Alberta would not defend our taxpayers, that, our, that my party, the United Conservative Party, stepped up to the plate and we defended Alberta taxpayers by seeking and obtaining intervener status at the appeal courts of Saskatchewan and Ontario on their respective judicial references on the constitutionality of the federal carbon tax. We will monitor the forthcoming decision in Ontario and we will continue to support our friends in the government of Manitoba. I am proud to say, and I'm pleased to note, that my friend Premier Higgs in New Brunswick is indicating the likelihood that he too will be launching a legal challenge uh, of the federal carbon tax. I am proud, Mr. Speaker, to have worked over the past two years on a growing national coalition of, pro of provincial governments, of provinces that are standing up for and defending Canadian taxpayers, while the NDP sold us down the river to their ally in Ottawa, we stood up for and with this bill continue to stand up for the economic interests of Albertans. We make no apology for that. Now let me say, while we will vigorously oppose the federal carbon tax at, at every step of the way, uh, because for all of the reasons I've already in, uh, articulated, let's, um, let's, I want to point out that as bad as it is, the, the, the federal carbon tax is not as bad as the one we in this legislature will right. repeal today. Uh, why do I say that? Well, first of all, federal carbon tax this year is at a $20 tax level, whereas the NDP carbon tax that we're repealing is at a $30 le level. So right away, people will pay less should the federal government impose on us. Secondly, as I already pointed out, um, as I already pointed out, the uh, federal rebates are much, much more generous than the provincial rebates. Only 40% of the NDP carbon tax went back in rebates, and that only to people in 60% of households, whereas 90% of the federal carbon tax revenues go back to, in rebates to 100% of households. So from just a pure cash perspective, people will be, frankly, better off than they were under the NDP carbon tax. And at least the federal government is recognizing the imputed cost on small businesses, but not, by not nearly as much as they should. And on this, I heartily agree with the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses' critique of the, uh, uh, the federal policy announced today on, on small business. But the NDP carbon tax had zero relief for small business or charities and nonprofits where the federal one does. Now, this is not an argument for the federal carbon tax, but I'm simply pointing out to my friends in the NDP that... It is not really a replacement, it is uh, less damaging, it's still damaging, but it's less damaging to Albertans' pocketbooks than the one imposed by the NDP. So Mr. Speaker, with all of that said, um, I want uh, Albertans to know that uh, we hope that, I should, let, let me back up and say Mr. Speaker, whether this bill is adopted today or next week uh, is, uh, I, I can, Assure Albertans that based on the announcement we have made, this bill will be effective tomorrow. Or today, 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 to May 30th. I should know that date. <laughs> May 30th. Today, May 30th, 2019, is the end of the NDP carbon tax. Here, here. In fact, I look forward uh, this afternoon to visiting a gas station in, in uh, southwest Edmonton to see, to observe as they actually switch the price down, saving Edmontonians money when they fill up at the gas tank. Here, here. So, the, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have barely been in office for a month, and we are already, today, delivering to Albertans the biggest tax break in our province's history. Here, here. And I should say to my colleagues, they should be proud of us.
So, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, uh, Albertans for their patience as we got to this day. And I can assure them uh, that the fight for our economy, for jobs, and for common sense is not over. That this government will take serious action to address the real challenge of greenhouse gas emissions, working with our partners across Canada and hopefully with jurisdictions all around the world. But at the same time, we will not, this government will not, punish Albertans for living normal lives. And for that reason, I urge all members to vote at third reading for Bill 1, the Carbon Tax Repeal Act. I'm at, and so, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm absolutely pleased to rise today and move third reading of Bill 1, an act to repeal the carbon tax. Here, here.